Welcome to AFI Fest presented by Audi. I'm Michael Lumpkin, the director of AFI Festivals. First, I want to thank those who support the festival, starting with Audi, our presenting sponsor for the past 17 years. Also, all of our many supporters, donors, and AFI members. And thanks to Meet the Press, our partner on tonight's screening. And to our audience, thank you for joining us for the world premiere of The Reagans, a four-part documentary series from our good friends at Showtime. The first two episodes are premiering here at AFI Fest, and you can catch the rest of the Reagans on Showtime starting November 15th. Tonight, we're happy to have with us the director of the Reagans, Matt Tiernauer. Matt's previous films include Valentino, The Last Emperor, Citizen Jane, Battle for the City, Studio 54, and Where's My Roy Kong? He is also an award-winning journalist and a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. Please welcome Matt Tiernauer. Talking with Matt tonight is NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press and the host of MTP Daily, Chuck Todd. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you, Michael, uh, very much. And as you know, we're very excited. As always, um, I'm glad to know that we are now just partners. We're not new partners anymore. We are just now, we're getting close to being able to say we're longtime partners. Yes. Um, but yes. we're very excited uh, about this. And I know we've got our own film festival with you guys coming up soon. Right. Um, but this is pretty exciting. Uh, and Matt, I have to say, uh, I really enjoyed uh, what I've seen so far um, uh, with the Reagans um, and with parts one and part two. So let me start the conversation this way. When did you decide you wanted to make um, make this documentary on the Reagans? And when you did, how did you decide to tackle it? Something that's been on my mind for a long time. Uh, I'm a native Californian. Uh, I'm native of Los Angeles. In fact, I grew up uh, one canyon over from where the Reagans lived in uh, the Pacific mm -hmm. Palisades. And I was uh, in um, basically, I think, elementary school and middle school when he was elected president. But the uh, shadow of Reagan loomed large over the California of my youth. And he had been governor uh, in my like, very young years. And mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in a, uh, a liberal household. And there was a real awareness of Reagan and uh, his personification of the emerging right in America at that time. So I was steeped in that by coming at it from the, the opposite side of the political ledger. In fact, I was kind of haunted by Reagan because in his old persona as a Goldwaterite, a hawk's hawk, a kind, someone who would uh, campaign against social security and would talk about winnable nuclear wars. Uh, he was a figure of, uh, of almost terror for me as a, as a young person. <laughs> then when he was elected president, I remember I was being driven to school that morning and we got caught in the motorcade of uh, the first presidential motorcade the day after he won, who was going to the Century Plaza Hotel to give uh, oh, a wow. news conference. So he's right. looped for me. In much the way you said that your colleague, uh, Tom Brokaw, was attached to Reagan uh, yeah. in a more significant way than I was, but Brokaw was the, uh, you know, the California guy for the NBC uh, News right. at the time when Reagan was governor. I just had this lifelong connection. And I've always felt that this was a narrative that was very managed by the White House, by the first couple. And I felt that it has been so effectively managed that a real unvarnished telling actually hasn't occurred. And I couldn't agree more. In fact, I've always thought, um, I'm curious, your source material, what did you use to sort of dive in? I always thought when Edmund Morris admitted he had to make up a character in order to tell the story of Dutch, yeah. Yeah. I felt like, well, talk about even he's admitting, I can't get to the essential truth of Reagan. And it is one of these things, and, and I, I, I could feel it watching your doc. I have always felt that reading these biographies of him, there is always something that it seems it's hard for us to get at. And I'll, I'll say this. You having Ron Reagan, having a family member, it at least 
it, it gave me at least some idea that maybe, maybe you finally are able to pick at this hole that none of us have been able to, 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 to see into. Well, Ron Reagan Jr., who gave us a, I think, seven-hour interview of wow. considerable candor. You've only seen the first two episodes, so yeah, there's so a more to come. Came from uh, says himself, uh, "There's ten percent of my father that's below the surface, and no one ever got to see. Uh, perhaps Nancy, uh, but even he, the son, felt that there was a mystery." The Edmund Morris biography, Ron Jr. says he thinks is the best portrait of his father. I would argue that Ron Reagan Jr.'s book, uh, My Father at 100, is mm. probably uh, one of the best uh, characterizations and portraits of his father. But it is a mysterious story because you're dealing with the only president who was a actor. And he was someone who was a performer and wore, as actors do, many masks. So he was, he was a pro at that. But to answer your question about source material, uh, I liked Morris's book well enough. I think it's an oddity. And yeah, I do too. <laughs> oddity is a good word. <laughs> deeply flawed uh, thing, but he's, he was a, a very bright, uh, accomplished man. There was a book that was written a few years into the Reagan first term that having read most Reagan biographies now, I think stands head and shoulders above still to this day. And it's called mm -hmm. Reagan's America by Gary Wills. And I think huh. Gary Wills, without the second term under his belt, only he wrote it probably starting in 81. Wow. He got to Reagan, I think, more than anyone else. And I so admired what he did. And that was a real uh, kind of eye opener and a, a bit of a guidepost for us. What is it that you think Gary captured about Reagan that, that it sounds like helped shape how you did this? It, it, let me ask you this. Did it shape your doc? The Gary, uh, Gary's yeah, portrayal? I was, very, I was very influenced by it. I think it's a masterpiece. And I think it's a, a forgotten masterpiece. So if anyone wants to I, pick it up, it's, it's very available uh, on Amazon in paperback. And uh, it, it was breathtaking. What he, what Wills, who is a brilliant man, and I've always been a fan, uh, what Wills got at was that the self-mythologizer was uh, born and alive and well in the teens and the 1920s in Reagan. He was the hmm. editor of his own story and the mythologizer and the self-deluder uh, who matured into President Reagan, who frequently people call that the role of his lifetime. Uh, right. But that was present when he was a very young man. And Wills uh, reports this. He doesn't just depend on previous biographies. He, he does interviews and goes into the archives of the state of Illinois to find mm -hmm. the evidence that Reagan was lying and obfuscating and editing and shaping the truth, which his own son, Ron Jr., I think, makes as his grandest point in this series, that his father was the editor of his own story. Later in life with Nancy Reagan, they were both really, really great, quote unquote, film editors of their own lives. Yeah. And that just brought it to the, the 10th power. And that's what we were subjected to for eight years as a nation. And I think we have to reckon with that. And I think it tells a lot about today, to be honest. You no, know, it, 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 there, I mean, obviously, the connectivity to today. I mean, I've always thought um, Donald Trump is trying to recreate the myths of Reagan, right? He, in some ways, he's trying, he wants those myths. He wants his own myths to be believed. And, but he does it so ham handedly that, that I guess Reagan's, Reagan's uh, gift was the fact that he was myth making in front of your face and it didn't bother people. They'd know it. He didn't serve in the war. Eh, he's a nice guy. He tells good stories. And meanwhile, Trump tries to create a myth, and everybody's like, you're full of it. And it, you see right through it. What do you think made Reagan so good at pulling the wool over our eyes? Because the greatest movies ever made, or at least the greatest concentration of greatest movies ever made, were made in the 1930s and 40s in Hollywood. And a great deal of them were made at Warner Brothers, where he was a contract player and a favorite of Jack Warner and a favorite of the publicity 
mavens and uh, gossip columnists, specifically Luella Parsons, who was actually, footnote to history, born in Dixon, Illinois, uh, 20 years before Ronald Reagan. By the way, that was a great little nugget. Like, you are absolutely right. Talk about dumb luck for Reagan, mm -hmm. right? To find out one of the beat reporters for your job came from your hometown. Yeah. Boy, talk about helping your mythology. Yes, well, there's a, a great book called uh, An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Invented Hollywood by Neil Gabler, who then went on to write another very good book called Life the Movie. Those two books together tell you a lot about why Reagan was so qualified to do what he did. He was uh, a very attentive observer and I think a fascinated participant in the studio system of Hollywood. He was a mentee of Luella Parsons who wrote the story of Hollywood for middle America. He was a product of, in essence, Mark Twain's America. He grew up in the river culture, in the river area of uh, rural Illinois. So these um, connections with the American psyche, if you will, and the repackaging of them and the interpretation of them, given to someone with a broadcast uh, megaphone, which Reagan had from a very early age as a radio broadcaster in his 20s all the way through his movie star period and TV period, become very powerful. If you have the secret codes to American myth and mythologizing and you personify it, you can be very effective, which is why I think Reagan snuck up on the press and the body politic, who he was always underestimated as a politician. But he had this he had these codes, almost nuclear codes, into the American psyche. And as Wills, Gary Wills, says himself, the reason that Reagan has this strong connection to the American psyche is that he comes at it from within. So there were yeah. secret ingredients to the success of Reagan that aren't widely understood and acknowledged. And that I saw as part of my mission. You know, um, I think that's just, um, it's, a, it's, it's pretty well put on how to sort of explain um, Reagan's gift in that sense. Here's another mystery of Reagan that I don't think is resolved yet. And I'm curious if you think you resolve it, um, and particularly in parts three and four. Is there intellectual firepower or not? Ronald Reagan Jr. says, my father was bright, but he knew what he knew. I think that his intelligence was underestimated. I think it was a kind of native intelligence. I think he had a very strong survival instinct and a very good way of uh, OEQ, let's say, deploying emotional IQ. In the high political IQ. Well, I might call it a high political IQ, right? Well, Being able to read people, read a moment, read a, you know. But anyway, go ahead. Well, be able to tell a story. I think that's where it starts with him. He was the son of an Irish teller of tall tales. He picked that talent up. He said his father was the greatest storyteller of all time. In Hollywood, he was known as a kind of motor mouth and a windbag, but he loved to tell the story. And he, I think he was an affable guy, so a lot of people liked him, but he pissed a lot of people off because as his... First wife, Jane Wyman, said, you ask Ronnie what time it is, and he tells you how to make the clock. <laughs> that says a lot about Reagan, I think. But he was able to tell these tales, and he uh, could read a room, which then were skills that I think uh, came in handy in his political career. And as James Baker III says, uh, when he's characterizing his former boss, uh, he didn't have any facts and figures. He wasn't a wonk, he didn't really know any details, but he could read the pulse, he could take the pulse of middle America pretty damn well. That's the kind of intelligence Reagan had. You do realize that that's what the current president's aides would say about him. Yeah, he doesn't get his facts and figures right, but he, he just innately understands middle America or understand. And I don't think that's actually true. I mean, I think we're seeing that where he may learn the hard way that he doesn't quite know that. But you do realize that a lot of us are going to do this. We're going to watch the Reagans and there's going to be, you know, what should we take out of this and how we got Trump? And would you connect those dots? Trump does. Trump believes he's an heir to this, to what Reagan left. Um, yeah. Is he? 
Uh, well, I mean, Trump wants that cast in a positive light. I would cast it in a, in a very negative light. Uh, there's a, a John Ford movie, and Reagan, though, he I don't think was ever directed by John Ford. He certainly wanted to be. And he understood how John Ford uh, packaged the myths of America. He was the greatest at it. And he worked with one of the greatest reactionaries who, alongside Reagan, John Wayne. Uh, so a lot of the DNA of this comes from this. And Reagan was the sort of stepping off the movie screen version of that type of reactionary figure. Uh, what is said in a, a John Ford film called The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, the grand conclusion of this, of this very good John Ford Western is, uh, when the legend becomes truth, print the legend, which is to say that Americans don't need hard facts and figures, and they don't want to be walked at, which is why Al Gore and Hillary Clinton aren't successful politicians for our present moment. What mm -hmm. I want to put forward in this series is that Ronald Reagan, who was a movie star, in hindsight, made total sense as the first president uh, to have been a movie star at the end of the 20th century. Americans had been anesthetized by the movies and been trained on this type of facts don't matter narrative and storytelling for some 50, 60 years before he assumed the presidency. It makes a certain amount of sense, I would say perverse and malign sense that 20 years into the 21st century, a reality TV star becomes president. I think the Reagans opened the door to that. I'm not so sure we would have a Trump presidency if it hadn't been for the Reagan presidency. And that, that's a, essentially what I was trying to get at here. If, if, if Reagan is sort of our culture's acceptance that television and the movies were real and that um, Donald Trump's election is this acceptance that I guess that reality television is at least real to enough people to get him elected, you know? And, and so in that sense, I guess there is a, there, there is a connection here. Let me ask you this. If you're a Reagan devotee, how are you going to feel about this? I'm not sure. I think there's a lot of information in this and a lot of history that would be fascinating to anyone who's interested in Reagan and even people who love Ronald Reagan. We interview Stuart, Stuart Spencer, who invented Ronald Reagan, the politician. He's in his 90s now. He was a, a brilliant brass knuckles political operator in California. One who, of the first, arguably, you know, who in some ways defined, defined the industry in fairness, you know, he wasn't the, the first, but he was one of the first. Absolutely. And he was, you know, told his tale. We interviewed him, I think for eight hours. What, talk about mm. stamina in your nineties. Can I just tell you, I am jealous. I'd love to see the cuts of those. I think <laughs> Stu Spencer, I mean, he's just a wealth of knowledge. He really is. No, absolutely. And uh, Spencer gave it unvarnished. I mean, he talked about, uh, how he admired Reagan's skills, but I think of anyone who, in Stu Spencer of all the people we interviewed were, is arguably the closest person to Reagan a lot. Maybe Ed Meese would be among that, that cohort, right. but it's a very small one. He was more unvarnished and critical actuals and his flaws than yeah. anyone we interviewed. He says, I don't think you saw this episode, but he went to Camp David with Nancy and Reagan, the, weekend before the first presidential debate of 1984. Spencer tells us that Nancy was full of it when she says that they shoved Reagan's head full of facts and he flubbed the debate. He didn't just flub it. I mean, he royally blew oh, yeah. the debate. Right. And Spencer says, they didn't shove him with facts. It's because when he got there, I brought the briefing book. I put it on the credenza in the presidential cabin. He calls me at 5 p.m. and says, hey, you want to watch a movie? Spencer says, yeah, what do you want to watch? Reagan says, how about bedtime for Bonzo? Uh, which is, for those at home who don't know, right. one of his not greatest movies. Spencer tells him no. And then Nancy calls him back and says, Reagan's pissed at you. You have to come watch the movie. And then he says, we just <laughs> kept watching movies all weekend. He didn't do his homework. He screwed up the debate. So you get that kind of stuff, which shows you something that's a key into Reagan that's very true. And if you want to make a comparison to the present occupant of the White House, he was lazy. 
He yeah. was a lazy man. Uh, at that point in his career, when it really mattered, when he was president, right. earlier in his career, he was less lazy. But he was a very limited man who had very particular and very strong skills, which are fully acknowledged in this series as, as a he, uh, storyteller. Yeah. Was he in, did you get, did anybody share, was he in on the joke? Did he understand he was a role? Did he know oh, I, what he was, do you know what I mean by that? Oh, I think so, yeah. I think uh, there was a wonderful moment that I found uh, in this where he's giving an interview at the, the Resolute desk in the Oval Office. It's very late in the presidency. And it's a British interview. I'm not sure who it was, actually. I think it was a producer. And he says to him, do you think of yourself as a politician? And it's classic Reagan. He kind of doesn't hear the question. Oh, no, right? this was in, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and he says, do you think of yourself as a politician? And Reagan pauses. And then his face kind of lights up and he's hiding a laugh and he says, no, ex actor. And I, for that, for me, if you want to talk yeah. about 10%, you don't see, I felt as if Reagan were pulling the mask off. He winked. Yeah. He gave you a verbal wink. Yeah. I really do think he believed that. And that, you know, Jimmy Carter, after the ride up Pennsylvania Avenue on inauguration day, when they're in the back of the limo together. And it's always awkward when you're changing parties. Sure. Especially to somebody that you lost to. And Carter, Try it that way. <laughs> Carter comes out of the limo and runs up to an aide and asks the aide, who's Jack Warner? Because <laughs> the, the guy's about to become the leader of the free world Hand on the nuclear Carter button. Stories about Jack Warner. And he's telling Carter stories about <laughs> Jack Warner. Now, the, the Jack Warner, who was the head of Warner Brothers, and was his mentor. Now, sure. You know, Obama gets out of the car uh, with Trump, I think, and had a similar experience, or at least out of the debrief meeting he had in the in the Oval Office. It was like, like mm. I tried to tell him about five or six things you really need to know about, and he, he wanted to talk about bullshit. Now, I don't want to make heroic comparisons to Reagan and Trump, there are none. Uh, but I do no, think, I, I know. as Neil Gabler put it, or the media industrial complex, or the, as I title the first episode uh, of the series, the Hollywood myth machine has done to us as a country. Well, your, your own personal knowledge of Hollywood really shines through this. I mean, this is what I think makes this very appealing is that it isn't stuck in the East Coast. <laughs> this is... It, look, I love. I've 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 been a sucker for all these um, docudramas, if you will, about old Hollywood that have that are getting. We're getting more and more of the truth, right? Mm -hmm. I guess out of Hollywood, every decade, every decade, we get a little more truth. Is that fair to say? You're giving us a little more truth about Reagan in Hollywood. We're getting a little more truth. Is that fair? Well, I think that you know there are two edges to the what I call the media industrial complex, uh, where. We're still seduced by media, but I think we're all um, more savvy consumers of media. And I think if we unpack the old myths, uh, we can understand better what they've done to us. And we can understand how we can uh, enjoy media still, but mm -hmm. understand the, the role it plays in our lives. I mean, what you do every day has a role in this, obviously. Sure. Cable News was born with the Reagan administration. CNN went on the air in the first months. And uh, I think what Trump understood in his own time frame that Reagan also understood is that you have to control the narrative. Right. And uh, somehow, uh, someone who's clearly not tech savvy uh, figured it out uh, in the form of Twitter, and yeah. he, he, he grabbed control. And then I, you, I'm sure, have producerial discussions every day before you're going to go on the air about how you're going to frame this. And I don't yeah. think, if you, mind me, if you don't mind me saying, that you've mastered it yet, because I think it's impossible to master. It's Not with Trump. So difficult. Yeah. yeah. No, it is. It, 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 isn't, it isn't easy. I mean, you know, I think we, 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 we all get declared it every day, is what I always say. Aha! this is the essential truth about Trump that we're going to get at today. And then all of a sudden that essential truth, you know, uh, blows up in your face. Um, Nancy Reagan, you know, everybody and you tackle her similarly and, and she's portrayed similarly here. Um, do you think, do you think she's given a big enough, cr enough credit for the creation of Ronald Reagan, Republican icon? 
No, I mean, this is one reason I wanted to do this. Uh, I really think, and Stu Spencer, who I think is an unimpeachable source on this, uh, mm -hmm. said on the record, uh, and again, you haven't seen episodes uh, three and four, and this is where this comes in. Not only did Nancy Reagan hold responsibility for making Reagan governor and president, Spencer, I'm quoting him now, said he wouldn't have been elected governor without Nancy or president. That's declarative. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the other thing that Spencer said, which I think is more news, is that she wanted credit in the end. And oh, interesting. One thing that uh, I really wanted to explore was, if you want to put it this way, which is a kind of sexy way to put it, looking at Nancy Reagan through a post-Hillary lens. Yes, that's a nice way of putting it. I like that. Here you have that. arguably the most powerful first lady, uh, with two exceptions. Uh, I think she has two peers in this, Edith Wilson. I was, was just going to say, yeah, right. And, and Eleanor Roosevelt, who wielded yeah. power in her own particular way. Eleanor Roosevelt's being sui generis. But I'm fascinated with Nancy Reagan because she was very successful in her endeavors, but she had to hide her power behind the facade of a typical 50s uh, housewife persona, something she played in the movies, by the way. She was an actress. Yeah, she, she also was an actor. Yeah. yeah. And uh, America bought into it. And she did have actually a very rocky time with the press because she had a real trouble trimming her sails and, and actually uh, shaking off a, a rather deserved, I think, Marie Antoinette-like <laughs> reputation. <laughs> but her power was hidden, but it was very, very potent. And I don't think the true extent of it really is enough discussed. And in the episodes you haven't seen, uh, the, the whole series really becomes about that without you giving away the store on the next two, on those last two episodes, three and four, uh, I take it you tackle Alzheimer's? Yeah, uh, and um, the son, Ronald Reagan Jr. is, uh, I believe more candid than he ever has been uh, about mm -hmm. this. Uh, he touches on it in his book, uh, My Father 100, but uh, let's just say he goes there. And um, mm -hmm. other people uh, who were sometimes in the room, also go there. Among them is uh, one of the, the greatest uh, witnesses to the Reagan administration is your colleague at another network, Leslie Stahl, who yeah. was there for the whole administration and then became host of Face the Nation. Uh, and she has a really uh, um, gut punch of a story about seeing the mm. dementia in the Oval Office and watching him being almost jump started with, with uh, mental jumper cables. And you know how they oh, did wow. it. Uh, no. The aide said, uh, Mr. President, uh, her husband's a screenwriter. And she said, he, 20 years fell away from him. And then he went into stories about, guess what? <laughs> Jack Warner, right. Warner Brothers. You know, it's funny you say that Dick Ebersol told me a story about, you know, the 1989 baseball all-star game was in Anaheim and Reagan called the first inning with Vin Scully mm -hmm. and he missed Bo Jackson's homer. Yeah. And it was a famous home run right. because he was telling a story. It turned out he had fallen off the horse a couple days earlier. The point was it might have been the last time that Reagan did sort of an event like that. Everything else was staged after that the last few times because it was one of the few times the public accidentally got a glimpse of, of him and how it works sometimes. He's all in consumed with one thing and he couldn't see what was happening in front of him. Anyway, it's, a, it's, um, it's sad when you hear these stories. It's sad, but it was also frightening, I think. And I think Iran Contra um, was a manifestation of that in some ways as well. I think Do you think, is that one of those things, do you think it's fair to say um, a bunch of people took advantage of the old man? Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't have such a sympathetic uh, take on it. I think that it was mm -hmm. a manifestation of a lot of, ling of lurking weaknesses that made Reagan mm -hmm. a much more dangerous president than he got credit for because uh, his management style was uh, exceedingly lazy and over-delegating, which uh, Colin Powell um, revealed to us on camera. And yeah. 
in Powell's words, which were measured, but it got him into trouble, which is to say the least. And uh, basically you had a rogue, uh, a rogue foreign policy running out of the NSC, which the president is obviously normally hovering over. And right. uh, this is very much Reagan's fault. Uh, he lucked out. I, I think he's one of the luckiest politicians and presidents uh, ever to hold the office where uh, his NSC advisor, Poindexter, um, probably took, took the bullet for him mm -hmm. and uh, he, he skated through. Uh, but I think this was a manifestation. Uh, but it's interesting, this is a really uh, interesting in the weeds thing that you'll appreciate, is that the way he handled his testimony, which was with a, to a form of uh, amnesia of convenience, which right. at the time might have been uh, incipient Alzheimer's, However, in the 1950s and 60s, when he was on the stand for uh, things pertaining to the Red Scare, right. the, uh, presidency of the Screen Actors Guild, and a uh, indictment by the, by the Kennedy Justice Department for an antitrust suit, he used the same technique of uh, amnesia of convenience. So it's one of those really fascinating things that I'm not sure history will ever unravel. Uh, whether this was tactical or whether it was an elision of, uh, you know, synapses no longer firing mm -hmm. with an old way right. of uh, surviving as a candy politician. So um, we're past our 30 minute mark. I know we can go a couple more minutes here. Let me, uh, I was curious, you shared something before we got started. Uh, how, how much of this documentary did you film during the pandemic and, and, I know you did some of it, and how'd you do it? We, uh, fully half of it was shot uh, during the pandemic. Uh, you can imagine, uh, I'm sure there were other filmmakers in this position where you're, mm -hmm. you're rolling strong one day and then suddenly yeah. you shut down. We got up back up and running. Uh, you know, it was one of those things, um, just throwing things at the wall and seeing what would work. We, we mm -hmm. figured out a way to shoot remotely using our, all of our new friends, Zoom, and uh, <laughs> a, a camera crews. And I'm very thankful to a lot of the uh, people who we interviewed, many of whom are, are not spring chickens, who were no, yeah. uh, welcomed us into their homes or on their back porches, including Dr. Fauci, uh, when he gave us the go-ahead to come to his house with a crew, and then I interviewed him over Zoom. And we, just in the, in the this is a film festival we can talk about, the tech of it all, we, we managed to create a kind of form of uh, a teleprompter camera where I'm virtually there. Wow. And I, you can't really tell that I'm not there. So it, uh, I, you know what, I was surprised when you told me you did a lot of half of this that way, it did not, you would not have known. I mean, that's, in fact, I thought, boy, how much of this material have you been working on this for years, you know, but but when I saw Schultz and Powell and Baker, I'm like, no, these are recent versions of them. Yeah. So you had to, it, uh, it was, it was quite impressive. Um, Roy Cohn, the Reagans, where are you going next, man? <laughs> I, wa I want to know because I want in. These are great. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. I, you know, it's like Rick Perlstein. Um, oh, you like, got to follow him around. <laughs> yeah. he's, I, I'm trying to figure out where he's going to go next. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I've, when I tackled the Roy Cohn subject, I was a little concerned. I thought, am I going to be able to interview all these sulfurous characters who were, you know, really evildoers of the right? Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I, um, you know, I'm a journalist by training, uh, but I'd never really gone into the belly of the beast that way. And I became quite addicted to looking at the, uh, the what I would call for me, the dark side of the moon. Uh, the underbelly, yeah. That's one reason I wanted to do this. I kind of cut my teeth on Cohn. And uh, I, I'm not sure politically uh, what to do next, yeah. but obviously uh, Trump and Cohn. I did I did Cohn as a metaphor for Trump, and in a way, I did Reagan as a metaphor. That's for what. Trump as well. That's no, but that's the best way to tackle Cohn. Yeah. There's no doubt. And to me, you just whet the appetite on Cohn, and I hope more people dig in because there's more to do. I mean, he's he is for. It's a, it's amazing how can how how far back he goes into a dark side of our history. Uh, when you think about his role uh, and all of that. Hey, Matt, congratulations again. Um, you know, and uh, uh, you ready for the premiere? All righty. Well, this, I think, uh, well, is the premiere in many it's, ways. The it's social the media slings and arrows will come a-calling, right? That's uh, the best absolutely. part of doing something this high profile. 
<laughs> it's it's not a good film unless you uh, have hate watchers. So uh, there, we're, there we're looking go. forward to that. Well, uh, I I loved it. You again, it's to get to the essential Reagan. I don't know. I think we're all still trying to figure that out, but um, you got closer uh, than I've seen. So congratulations. Thank you.